Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you. Sorry, I'll try not to do that again. Was that me? I'm like, I won't move during this entire presentation. Um, thank, I, I just want to say thank you to the Sajad and the Mapbox team for the work they do. Um, I'm probably one of the people who screwed up once or twice. I was hoping I wouldn't be outed on your, um, but it's important, right? So I wanted to sort of break the ice today by uh, stepping into the confession booth um, and admitting some of my faults. Uh, I have about a thousand things going through my head right now based on everything that I've learned and the conversations I've had. Um, so I'll try to be as coherent as I, as I can today. Um, I wrote a pretty bad abstract for this conference. Uh, I sort of mailed it in because I was traveling and I didn't have time and um, I didn't make the original cut. They didn't want me up here. I was kind of on the bubble, but thankfully uh, they made room for me. So thank you, organizers. Um, one of the things I screwed up was I mistakenly predicted that our latest satellite would be up in space right now collecting data. It's still on the ground, so apologies for that. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, another confession, I'm a huge space nerd, and I don't know if that's controversial or not, because I know OpenStreetMap's a terrestrial project, so we map things on the Earth, but I'm very interested in celestial things, so I'm going to talk a little bit about space today, if that's okay. I still have a couple more. Uh, I have a list here. Uh, my presentation might be a little controversial, um, so apologies in advance. Last, uh, I'm a gamer, so uh, late at night after the kids are asleep, uh, while my wife is watching The Real Housewives of whatever city, uh, I'll go up and play Xbox. Um, that's my outlet. The thing I like about it is you can level up when you play games. Are there any gamers out here? Raise your hand, all right. A few gamers, all right, cool, in good company. Uh, you level up, and I love that concept, and there's a lot of gamifications in OSM, which is great, um, but I believe OSM has leveled up in the past few years, and I wish we kept track of it, but the observation I had, uh, and this is where I ended my State of the Map US talk, and I'll start there, is I've seen so much activity in the past 12 months. Um, I've been around OSM for about five years, and when I started, first started working on it, it was at that time seen as pretty much a hobby. Well, it's grown up into something that's much more of a hobby um, and it's being used all around the world for incredibly important initiatives. So um, to give you an example, I was asked by a CEO of a company recently, a US company, who asked me, what is OpenStreetMap? And Mikkel kind of referenced this in his talk. I think we all have different explanations. So I wanted to be as quick and to the point. It's a database of the Earth's features and it's created by users. That's it. I mean, it's much more than that, but I wanted that person to remember it, so I didn't want to go on for 10 minutes. Uh, so the person asked me, well, is it done? And I said, no. Well, when's it going to be done? And I said, never. Uh, not applicable. Um, by the way, I'll license this whole thing as Creative Commons, so if you want to take it and use it, that's fine. Add to it. Um, it's never going to be done. Uh, the Earth changes every single day, right? Um, and so my job at Digital Globe, uh, we collect imagery of the Earth every single day. Not the entire Earth, but large portions of the Earth. Uh, and to me, imagery is a staple for editing an OSM. I cannot edit OSM without imagery. And I don't know if that's just me. It might be just me but I feel like it's really important. And I feel like it's almost like Wi-Fi or electricity. You don't realize how important it is until it, it's not there. Uh, can anyone relate to that today? I don't know. <laughs> um, so I did a little research recently, and I found this wiki page on armchair mapping. And this is how I knew my presentation was going to be controversial, because the wiki page told me it's going to be controversial. This is a, you, you can go to this link, um, it literally says armchair mapping is controversial and not widely accepted as a good idea. So that means only a narrow portion of the community believes this is a good idea. Um, and most of the community believes it's a bad idea and controversial. Not only that, but it, it tells you what normal mapping is compared to abnormal mapping, which is armchair mapping. So 
I guess I'm abnormal, but that's okay. And we all have our opinions, and that's okay as well. It's great. Um, so that, that caused me to think a lot about my life. Thank you, whoever wrote that. Um, the Mapbox guides are fantastic. Um, the Mapbox guides have a little different perspective, and they say the availability of high-resolution satellite imagery has allowed OSM's data volume to explode. Good explosion, I'm assuming, right? Meaning it's pervasive, we can add things, um, we can do work from home, we don't have to be out in the field. When there's an emergency on the other side of the earth, we can all contribute, we don't have to be where the emergency is. It's really easy and fast to go into OSM and trace features from imagery. So I also found that perspective uh, interesting. So we have different perspectives. So here's a bike trail in Erie, Colorado, where I'm from. Um, and whether this was a GPS trace or a trace from imagery, imagery helps me make sure that I didn't just put this on Null Island or Pacific Ocean, wherever, um, because I'm not that smart. I can say, yep, I got it. Um, and even if I traced it, um, I think there's still value there. So uh, Ambassador Mustard actually sort of kicked off this presentation. I really enjoyed his, his presentation. And he talked about this battle he was having with a local contributor because he was adding features and that contributor was looking at old imagery and deleting it. Um, so I think this is a problem we can actually solve together. So my question is, uh, and if anyone's feeling brave, uh, where does this imagery come from? Space. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. I did not, I don't even, I don't know, know if we've met. I'm Kevin. Uh, that was not rehearsed. So, yes, a lot of imagery comes from space. Uh, I think I just made your day with that, right? Um, some imagery comes from the air by the form of aircraft or UAVs. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about space, and I warned you this was coming. So this is a uh, star killer base in an unknown uh, system that the uh, First Order took over. I'm just kidding. I was just making sure everyone was paying attention, which you are. Uh, by the way, um, I love Star Wars, obviously. That whole film is about mapping, if you didn't know that. Hopefully I didn't spoil anything, but locations uh, ingrained in the entire plot of the movie. Back to the real space this time. Uh, this is what space looks like from the Hubble telescope. Um, I am absolutely fascinated in humans' achievements up in space, and it started with Sputnik. Um, this is an early Atlas rocket that was launching in the 70s. Um, if you believe that we've sent someone to the moon, there's a picture of it. I happen to believe that, but a lot of people don't. Well, some people don't. Um, then we went to Skylab, we built space shuttles, we have the ISS. Uh, these are amazing achievements. We're continuing now with the Juno mission, Rosetta, which is uh, by the ESA, and OSIRIS-REx, which is going to go take a sample of the asteroid. This stuff absolutely fascinates me. I could do a boff on this, um, but I won't. I'll save it for a space conference. The thing that, one of the things that fascinates me is we failed more times than we succeeded. We have blown a lot of things up, and people have died, and things have been lost. Uh, and we, we've learned a lot from that. And I think as developers and people who are launching tools and projects, we can all relate with that. Like, you have to fail 10 times before you can succeed. Um, if you don't believe me, you can watch a movie called The Right Stuff. Please go watch that movie. Uh, one of the things the right stuff we're doing, we're trying to launch this system called the Hexagon, and this was recently declassified, and it's really fascinating. This is a massive 60-foot-long uh, piece of spy equipment that was launched in the Cold War that used film. This was in the 70s, so no digital cameras, no uh, communications like we have today. And they actually had a cassette, remember cassette like VHS, um, so they'd actually roll film, take pictures, this entire unit fun um, to keep its uh, momentum and stability. Uh, and when the film was used up and ready to be developed, uh, they dropped it. Because that's what you did in the, in the 70s. Uh, so you created a heat-resistant shield, you dropped the film, 
and you didn't want to drop it onto your enemy's territory, so you would fly over the parachute and scoop it up. True story. Um, you can read, read about that as well. Things have changed. Um, so fast forward 40 years. Uh, this is Digital Globe's latest satellite. Her name is World Before. She has a Twitter handle. Don't be shy. You can follow her. Um, things have changed. Technology has changed. Um, we build large satellites. These are not microsatellites. Sorry to disappoint if you're wanting to learn about microsats. These are big satellites, and the reason we do that is to get the accuracy, the resolution, and the agility that we need for mapping and other things, many other things, we need a big platform. Um, so accuracy, we're, we're about plus or minus three meters, which is better than the GPS signal on your phone, about equivalent to like a Garmin GPS. Resolution, this means uh, uh, the size of our pixel and what we can resolve on the ground. And agility, and I'm, uh, apologies for my very American reference to Texas, but I did a conversion. Uh, there's about 23 Belgiums per Texas in size of area. So I went on to the converter.com and figured that out. Uh, Myanmar is also about the same size as Texas. So to look at what this looks like in scale, there's a person, there's some microsatellites, and the one on the very right is uh, one of our satellites. Why do we do this? Um, we, can, we can take advantage of the latest technologies in uh, circuits and components and software, but unfortunately we can't change the laws of physics. Uh, not at least in this galaxy, maybe in another galaxy physics might work differently. So physics is constant and there's a constant formula to calculate resolution. Um, and it's actually easy and fun for a super nerd like me to go do this. Um, so I calculated the resolution of a 400 millimeter Nikon SLR on the space station flying at 400 kilometers in space. That's what the top one is. Landsat is next. Landsat's very similar to Sentinel in its focal length and its orbit height. Uh, our, this is World U3, uh, the third one down with a focal length of 16 meters. Um, if anyone's a photographer, uh, 16 meters is a very powerful lens. Uh, and then uh, Planet Labs uh, is at the bottom with a different, a different system with a different focal length. And these things can all work together in harmony. These are not similar technologies. Um, to put it in business terms, these are not competing technologies. So I actually wanted to create an example. This is Vancouver. I'm from Canada, so I wanted to choose a Canadian example. Sorry about that. It was very selfish of me. Vancouver is a great city, though. Um, and this is what it looks like from the space station. Um, and fortunately, as you zoom in, things begin to pixelate. And as we all know from looking at Landsat and Sentinel data, pixelating raster imagery is not very helpful when we want to go map the center line of a road or a sidewalk or whatever you want to map. So you can bring in Landsat imagery. It's a little bit better. Zoom in, it gets pixelated. OK, I need, I need to jump up. So this is the Planet Labs imagery of, of Vancouver. Again, same thing, zoom in. It gets a little pixelated. So now I'm going to pull in a digital globe image, and now I can actually see lane markings on the road. I can actually zoom in. I can see vehicles, um, and, and the high resolution allows me to digitize those features. This is, this is what we've all been used to, thanks to Google Earth and then Bing Maps and Yahoo Maps back in the day. Um, now Apple Maps, uh, Mapbox Satellite, we're used to this stuff. Um, and this is the business that Digital Globe is in is to continue to maintain and collect this type of imagery for mapping. Um, one example I wanted to use in terms of agility, I used the Texas example, so I'll use something different. Um, our satellites are maneuverable, and in order to maneuver, we have massive control mountain gyros. You ever done that experiment where you sit on a swivel chair and you hold a bike, and you spin the bike tire, and then you turn it like this? Anyone? A couple people. That's uh, your angular momentum moving you around. So we have that on our satellite. So as a fun experiment, we are flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that uh, the little Hamilton you see, that's uh, Bermuda. Is that Bermuda? I always get those mixed up. It's not Barbados. It's Bermuda. So we're way out 
in the Atlantic Ocean about 2,000 kilometers away from New York City. It was a clear sunny day in January in New York City, so we decided to take a look. Um, and we saw New York and New Jersey and Coney Island and Staten Island and everything in the scene from 2,000 kilometers away. And we could actually see it at about 70 centimeter resolution from that distance. That's an example of what a long focal length will get you. Um, we, could actually, actually, we could actually count taxi cabs on the street. Uh, the building right in the middle is the UN, where everyone was last year. So this is kind of a novel example. You're thinking, well, Kevin's just showing off. Um, but this has real applications. We do this, um, not to this extreme, but we do it every single day. Best example I had was in Nepal last year, Kathmandu. Um, after the earthquake hit, if, if you all remember, it was rainy for like three or four days straight. Uh, this is a blog from my good friend Charlie, who I always reference Charlie Lloyd's work in all of my presentations. Uh, so thank you, Charlie. Uh, this is a blog post he wrote about how cloudy it was. So he looked at the imagery we were collecting versus Landsat data, how cloudy, cloudy it was over Nepal. And of course, thousands of people were uh, buried, were in need, uh, relief efforts were underway. Everybody in the world was asking us for imagery. Not everybody, but it's, it felt like a lot of people. So we flew over Nepal, cloudy, flew over Bangladesh, cloudy. We flew into the Indian Ocean, cloudy. I don't know what happened there. Oh, there it is. There was a hole in the clouds, we took a picture. And that picture is the one you're looking at on the right, Kathmandu. <laughs> it was amazing. There's a hole in the clouds right above Kathmandu, we saw it, we took the picture, and we published it with an open license, and people went nuts. And that was great. Uh, an example of how having an agile satellite can really change the world. This is a term we all use, space is hard. Um, we're learning this very, um, very real right now. This is um, us shipping our satellite from Sunnyvale, California to Santa Barbara. We had a police escort, and the reason we had a police escort is because a drunk driver ran into our police escort. So the police took him out and didn't hit our satellite, um, which is important to us. We get it to the Air Force Base. We load it in a big fairing. Then we ship the fairing across the Air Force Base. This whole process takes days and days and days and weeks. Um, we lift it up about 25 stories. We put it on top of a rocket. We get the rocket ready to go. Um, there it is. We were going to launch this on September 16th. We rolled back the tower. We were 20 minutes away from launching. The countdown was about to begin. The champagne was on ice. Uh, and, and here's what the facility looks like. Um, everything's ready to go. You keep the oxygen, liquid oxygen, away from the liquid hydrogen because you don't want to mix those things. I'm glad you all got that joke. Um, the tubular thingy, the fire comes out is right there. Fire comes out the bottom. You don't want fire coming out any other place. When we're all set and ready to go, we, uh, one of the people on the base noticed something that was abnormal. And it was a, a small leak in one of the fueling systems. So we, we stopped. We, they call it scrub, scrub one. Um, then a fire broke out, a forest fire. Um, so we had to scrub another launch. And my new thing is, Getting to space is hard, right? Space is hard, getting to space is hard. So we're a commercial company, we're not a government. Uh, we don't get taxpayer funding. ESA, NASA um, get taxpayer funding, uh, which is nice. We don't get taxpayer funding. So we're a business. And I'm often asked, what is your business model? Um, so I'll do it in 60 seconds, because I think I only have like 120 seconds left. We raise money in order to launch satellites and build ground systems. Um, we take that data and we create APIs and platforms and tools. If anyone's interested in those, go to developer.digitalglobe.com. I've been asked a few times about that. And we license our content. Uh, we license our content to companies such as these and organiza organizations around the world, NGOs, governments, and they essentially pay us for our data. And we don't we take that money and we invest it in new satellites. That's the cycle. Um, this has worked for us for a decade and a half. Um, satellites don't last forever. 
offer. So our plan is to keep on doing this um, and launch more satellites so that OpenStreetMap has fresh imagery to trace from or to validate from. Um, lastly, there's always exceptions to the rule. So there have been many times um, where we've said, you know what, that business, let's pause that business model for a second and let's open our data. I mentioned Nepal. This year we opened up Ecuador. Um, it, as an example, the other night at the Mapathon, this was fantastic at Doctors Without Borders. Uh, Digital Globe was able to donate um, some imagery of uh, the DRC, um, which is great because it gets everyone involved. It allows easy access. And this is a part of the world where um, there was no good coverage, uh, no high-resolution satellite. So we were able to augment and, and help out. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. That's um, hopefully that gave you an overview of what we're all about, what we do. Uh, yes, we are a business, um, but that shouldn't scare anyone because we're like real people with real feelings as well. So thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I'll take any questions. Thank you for the presentation. First question in the back. How often can you move the satellite since it requires fuel and fuel is uh, running out slowly? Yeah. Um, how often can we move it, did you say? Okay, good question. So the movement is actually done with those gyros, but we're in a low enough orbit that gravity is actually pulling us down. So the fuel we use is actually to boost our orbit. So every few days, we're using 